Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. In this video, I am going to discuss a topic which is very near and dear to my heart. I am very curious and passionate about learning as how exactly these large language models are so good in predicting the next token or for instruction following or in other words, how exactly they work within them. When I first heard about the fact that we really don't know how um, the inner workings or mechanistic of these models are, I was quite surprised because I thought maybe it is all the just mathematics and probability where we would just give an input to the model, model will process it in its layers and then it will just churn out an output and we would know that okay. It's all mathematics. We know that, okay, this uh, token gets to this layer, to this neuron, then this function just uh, calculates the loss and all that stuff and then creates an output. But it was quite an eye-opening stuff when I learned about the fact that we really don't know how these models work. A lot of companies have tried to come up with tools which try to spotlight the inner workings of a model, but still, I am yet to find a good tool which tells us in simple words how these things work. That is why when I saw this project by Google's DeepMind, Gemmascope, which tries to figure out how exactly Gemma2 model works inside, I was quite intrigued and in this video we are going to install this Gemmascope and then we will try to see how the Gemma2 2, 2 billion parameter model works. We will just take one layer of the model and then we will go through it. And I will be using Google Colab's free Colab notebook. And But you can, of course, use these commands and notebook anywhere you like on Linux systems, Windows or wherever you have your setup uh, configured. And I will drop the link to this notebook in video's description. But before that, let's try to understand a bit more as what exactly this Jamascope is doing. Let me play a video from this website of Google's DeepMind and I will drop the link to it in video's description too. Let's see what is happening here. So the question which user asked was where is the city of lights? So <clears throat> first what happened is that if I just take it back a bit so that this is a text input, right? It was by, we used tokenizer to convert it into tokens, which means that it could be word or sentences. Then these tokens were converted into numerical representation or embeddings. And from there, it went into some of the hidden layers and then it just, um, you know, some weights were calculated, some bias was added in the neurons and then uh, it is just going within the layers, going into this MLP and then it is it has um, zeroed in on few of the images you see. There are some from Brazil, some from China, I think um, some from Germany and then it is just zeroing in, zeroing in, calcul maybe you know doing the back, back propagation and all this machine learning mumbo jumbo. We don't have to worry about it. So and then it is just um, decoding it or unembedding it then creating the raw data out of it or logits as we call it it's a raw output of the model and these logits are converted into probabilities or tokens and then eventually we get this answer paris from the model so what is happening here i mean okay so we know this is paris we know that this these are logits this is okay but all this stuff how these things get activated how this how model is reached to these few images, uh, this is still largely a mystery and that is where Gemmascope tries to figure out whenever something is asked from a model, what exactly gets activated. We all know that to create an artificial intelligence language model, um, AI engineers or machine learning engineers, they build a system or model or neural network that learns from vast amount of data without human guidance. As a result, the inner workings of language models are often a mystery even to the researchers who train them. This is the field which is called as mechanistic interpretability. And this focuses on learning 
how these inner workings of model actually play out. Researchers in this field use a concept called as sparse encoders as a kind of microscope scope or spotlight that lets them see inside a language model and gets a better sense of how it works. So in order to understand how a model works, it's quite important to understand what is meant by sparse encoder. So first, let's try to get this concept out of the way. When we say autoencoder, it means a net neural network that copies the input data like an image or a text. It simplifies it into a shorter code like a summary of something and then it reconstructs the original input from the simplified code. As an example, just consider that you have a huge text file, right? That is your input data. And then we encode it with the help of autoencoder, which means that maybe you are zipping it. So you get a zip file or an encoded file. And then <clears throat> this autoencoder reconstruct this back to your actual data, which is an unzipped file. So this is how autoencoder works. When we say sparse, sparse means mostly empty or mostly zero. Only a few important elements are kept while the rest are ignored or set to zero. For example, imagine a huge library with mostly empty shelves. Only a few shelves have books on them, making it sparse. In the context of autoencoders, sparse means that only a few neurons, or uh, in this case, our model's neurons, are activated or fired when processing the input data. The rest are quiet, like the empty shelves, because model gets trained on billions of uh, data points, and if we ask it, what is the city of lights? You just have to go through few of the neurons to, and it will only activate those neurons. So the path which our model takes in order to reach to a conclusion is quite sparse. It only touches upon few of the neurons while the rest of them are quiet. By enforcing sparsity, we encourage the autoencoder to focus on the most important features of the data, making it more efficient and effective. And by, when I say features, features are the distinctive characteristic that helps us, helps us understand and describe the data. For example, if you are building a model to recognize uh, Paris or City of Light, some features could be uh, Eiffel Tower or France or Europe, Western Europe, uh, French language, something like that. So these features describe City of Light. So now we understand what is sparse, what is autoencoder and what is meant by sparse at autoencoder and how it works on this stuff. Now, these sparse, sparse autoencoders are also called as SAEs and again these are the type of neural networks which are variant of auto, traditional autoencoders, right? Okay, now we know what exactly is happening here. Let's go back to our discussion of Jamascope. So, Jamascope is a new set of tools to help researchers understand the inner working of Jamma2. And Jamma2 is, by the way, a lightweight family of open models. And I have done like 30, 40 videos on Jamma2 from various angles. And they are freely available. And they use open sparse autoencoders for uh, just to help researchers to see what is happening inside and they are embedded into it so you don't have to worry about it and there is another tool which I will discuss later on it is called as Mishax and that is also uh, enables the interpretability work behind Yamascope but we'll discuss it in another video now we you all we, I already have showed you this video which makes it easier to understand and this is let me play it again because this is just a stylized representation of using a sparse encoder to interpret a model's activation as it recalls the fact that the city of light is Paris and we see that French related concepts are present while unrelated ones are um, singled out and we are not facing on them now. But, but the researchers face a key problem here. The model's activations are a mixture of many different features. In the early days of mechanistic interpretability, Researchers hoped that features in a neural network activation would line up with individual neurons, but that doesn't happen. So 
neurons even get activated for many unrelated features for example if you again look at this one um, for the city of light it even went to brazil and few other chinese building that has nothing to do with uh, city of lights right so that is where things get a bit more interesting and that is where sparse autoencoder helps out a given activation will only be a mixture of small number of features even though the language model is likely capable of detecting millions or even billions of them the model uses features sparsely for example a language model will consider relative relativity when responding to an inquiry about einstein and consider eggs when writing about omelets but if it is considering the omelet it won't consider relativity and there are a lot of other examples sparse autoencoder leverages this fact to discover a set of possible features and break down each activation into a smaller number of them look at this example in this is example in which the tokens where the feature fires are highlighted in gradients of blue according to their strength so this is just an idiom and this is just an example activations for a feature found by the sparse en encoder each bubble is a token word or and token means word or word fragment and the variable blue color illustrates how strongly the feature is present there are some darker blue and then there are some lighter blue and uh, um, the here the feature is more related to idioms by the way so what makes this jama scope so unique well because it uses sparse encoder and we already have gone into detail as what exactly uh, happens there and by the way they have around 400 sparse encoders with more than 30 million learned features in total and this jama scope is going to enable researchers to study how features evolve throughout the model and interact and compose to make more complex features okay so that is all done and good and by the way last point on this one gemascope is also trained with their new state-of-the-art jump ReLU sae architecture the original sparse and autoencoder struggle to balance the twin goal of detecting which features are present but this jump ReLU architecture makes it easier to strike this balance appropriately and that significantly reduces the error okay so hopefully by now you understand the whole conceptual framework where i'm getting to now let me take you to my google colab and let's create a new colab here and then we will see it in action how exactly this works and courtesy to google let's use their free gpu i'm just going to change the runtime to t4 gpu that's done first up we have imported some of the libraries which we are going to use for this demo transformer hugging face numpy and pytorch let's log into hugging face first because we'll be downloading gemma 2 model which is a gated model what it means is that you would need to go to hugging face sign up with your free email account and get a token and i already have the token just grab the read token from hugging face profile of yours very simple to do and all free let me paste my token here and click on login and then you can see that my login is successful now okay so that said and done um, let's also set our model and then we are going to download that model it's not a big model so it should be able to uh, should be good and then we are just optimizing the memory here and you can see that there are three tensors of this gemma 2 model of size around 5 gig so let's wait for it to get downloaded i think it is just going to take a bit of a time so let's wait for it and model is downloaded and also is loaded onto our gpu next up let's also grab the tokenizer this should be fairly quick tokenizers are very lightweight and that is already done now we have loaded the model we have loaded the tokenizer uh, let's try running it we will just give it a sample prompt and see how it works and as i mentioned earlier don't worry about that notebook commands i'm going to put the link to it let's wait so you see so i'm just using this prompt here would you be able to travel through time using a wormhole and then you can see that it has responded as back so that confirms that our model has loaded fine now next up we are we have got our gemma 2 
so let's load one of the sparse auto encoder so as i mentioned earlier gemma scope actually contains over 400 sparse auto encoders but for now we'll just load one on the residual stream at the end of layer 20 um, and by the way uh, there are layers start from zero so in actual this will be the 21st layer so let me show what i mean here so you see i'm just specifying this repo this this is a sparse encoder and then this is a layer 20 within the model which i'm specifying for this so let's run it it has loaded it that is all done it's very lightweight and then let's set it up with the sparse encoder and if you don't understand these commands don't worry too much about them these are mainly setting the kv values and now let's implement the sparse auto encoder so what we are going to do now we are going to define the forward pass of this sae um, and then we will see how it works forward pass means that when you give the input tokens it goes through different layers and that is what we want to see right as it moves through the models and it layers how actually it works and this is um, all the encoding decoding which is happening we are specifying this jump ReLU, which i mentioned earlier this is a technique which it uses uh, don't worry about these too much this is just a technical implementation of it we are encoding it to create a latent space then we are decoding it back and then this is the forward pass so let me define these functions and then we are going to call them and this is a whole code which is provided by google so it is specific to their use case where we are specifying the shape of the matrix and the parameters and as i said earlier don't worry too much about it if you don't understand all the keys are good and now let's get our get out some activations from the model at the sparse auto encoded target site and then it is going to demonstrate uh, how to do it manually first and then through the pytorch hook so again let me put a google provided function here and let's not worry about its inner workings it is just right as per this pass auto encoder and then let's initialize it by calling it so i'm just gathering the residual activations and then from here we can run it on the saved activations so this is where i am calling this sparse auto encoder or se.cuda and it has given us this function name and let me activate it and you can see that we are activating it with this again we are calling it that is all good and then you can uh, let's also double check that the um, that the model looks sensible by checking that we explain a decent chunk of variance so let me just give it just a tensor value here with calculating the mean of it there you go so it looks good it's on the device CUDA um, and this sparse auto encoder is supposed to have an L0 of around 70 so let's also check that yep that looks okay to me and also it is worth checking that this sort of thing when you do this by hand so you can also check out the highest activating features as what exactly it uh, calculated and of course you would, you might need to do it manually and these are all tensor values if you're interested into the mathematics but if you don't understand what happened previously with all of these matrices and numbers don't worry too much about it let me show you what is important here in the graphical format so let me play it it is simply using this ipython to generate this and you see this is where the raw output of uh, the model this is a uh, actual output of the model and this is where activations have happened these are the neurons which have been uh, fired and this is where it has traveled through uh, the all the layers and when we ask that question about travel to the wormhole you see these the darker greens were fired and for example this ancient it wasn't fired at all this is just uh, very quiet it is all sparse uh, activations which have happened and the sparse auto encoder has been able to figure it out but got fired and that helps us understanding whenever we give it a prompt as what neurons were activated so this is what it is doing 
and all in all what it is doing it is helping us out in understanding the inner working of the model so really good stuff uh loved it i mean i think this is this gives us more insight into how these things work it's always good to know that's it guys i hope that you enjoyed it let me know what do you think if you like the content please consider subscribing to the channel and if you're already subscribed please share it among your network as it helps a lot thanks for watching